let's say we have an application wherein we want to get 100,000 products from an external website. That is, we need to make an HTTP call to get each of the products. Once we get the product, we, we, we need to update the price using some algorithm and we need to store that product to the database. One way to solve this is to create a fixed thread pool of size 10, that is, there will be 10 threads running at a time. And then for 100,000 products, we'll get the product ID, which will be just the integer, and we'll create those many tasks. In the task, we'll retrieve the product using that product ID, we'll update the price, and we'll save that product into the database. Once that task is created, we'll just submit that to the thread pool. Now, out of those 10 threads, let's take the example of one thread. So in this case, it's thread one. When this thread for a particular product tries to call the retrieve product, which is an IO operation, that thread will have to wait for that site to return the response. So that response could be immediate or could take a few hundred milliseconds or even longer. In that case, the thread one will go into the waiting state. After it gets the product, it needs to update the price. Let's say that's a computational intensive method. It doesn't require any IO operation. So it will run as is. There'll be no waiting, no blocking. And then when it needs to save into the database, again, it needs to wait for the confirmation from the database. And that's why the thread will again go into a blocking state. As represented here, at step one, the thread is blocked. At step two, which is CPU intensive, so it's running. And at step three, again, the thread is blocked. Yes, so any kind of CPU operation, it doesn't need to block, but any kind of IO operation, the thread will have to block. And there are other reasons for which the thread can block. We already saw the IO operation. It could be the network, which is the HTTP call, or it could be the database, which is the disk. A thread could also block on waiting for locks. And the thread can also block on any concurrent utilities. For example, if you're using a countdown latch and you do a countdown latch.await, a thread can block on that. So let's say that particular IO operation of fetching that product from an external site, let's say that takes two seconds. So in that two seconds, all the 10 threads for 10 products will hit that external site, but they all need to wait for two seconds. And that is an inefficient use of the CPU because your CPU is idle for those 10 seconds while all the threads are waiting for that IO operation to complete. One way to get around this is to use a cached thread pool. In cached thread pool, we do not have an upper limit on the number of threads we create. So let's say all for the two seconds that the threads are blocked, the cached thread pool will keep creating more and more threads to satisfy more and more tasks. And let's say after two seconds, when the cache thread pool has created around 12,000 threads, the first few threads which had called the IO operation has got the response back. So now the cache thread pool doesn't need to make more threads. It can reuse the initial created threads. Now the CPU is being used more efficiently, but each thread takes around one MB of memory. So if you have 12,000 threads, it's going to consume a lot of memory and you can have a JVM crash or an out of memory exception if your heap size is not large enough. So the problem we have is when you're waiting for the threads, your CPU is idle. To get around it, if you create too many threads, then it will consume a lot of memory and a task always waits or blocks whenever there is an IO operation. One way to get around this problem is to use reactive programming. In reactive programming, instead of waiting for an IO operation to complete, we'll ask the reactive framework itself that here's the IO operation. Once you complete the IO operation, here's my algorithm or the next method that I want to call. Here's the method, you call it when the IO operation is completed. So now the thread one only submits that algorithm to the reactive framework and the framework takes care of calling that method which is also known as callback once the IO operation is completed. And all the threading is handled by the reactive framework itself. So you can efficiently use your CPU and use only a limited number of threads to perform your thousands of IO operations. If you're using Spring Web Flux, which is one of the reactive frameworks, 
maybe you can use it in this way loop from 1 to 100000 like we did before but now the code is not sequential you have to provide callbacks or the methods or the algorithm that you want the framework to perform so you will say that for 1 to 100000 get that integer put it into product id retrieve the product once you get the product use that product to update the price and once you update the price then they use that product to save into the database so now you have solved the threading problem but it has introduced a new problem where you have to learn a lot of these methods of this framework to perform your normal code flow so as we saw the problem with reactive is you need to learn a huge number of apis to work with it if your flow is very complicated newcomers may not be able to understand them and since all the threading is taken care of by the reactive framework it is not very easy to debug those things so what we ideally want is a concept where we have a very lightweight threads where thread do not consume a lot of memory and we can keep using the existing apis and that's the exact problem that an upcoming feature of java called java fibers is trying to solve so let's try to understand how Java Fibers solves our problem. Here we have a runnable which has four operations. It does some calculations, it acquires a lock, updates a resource, and it does an unlock operation. So that's the task one. Similar to execute a service, we can say submit this particular task to be run. Like execute a service, the task will be mounted or task will be started by a particular thread. Once that particular task reaches lock.lock .lock operation or any kind of IO operation or database operation, which is a blocking operation, will unmount that task from the thread. So instead of the thread blocking, it will take out the task from the thread. And while taking out, it will save the current state of that task. So any local variables and the stack of that particular task is saved separately now the third one having saved the task one and its current state in memory it is free to take or run any other tasks so if there is any other task comes it will mount that task say for example task 2 and it'll start running task 2 once the io operation on which the task one was waiting for let's say that io operation finishes now the task 1 can proceed and do its next operations. In this case, the scheduler will find the right thread which is free. So let's say in this case, thread 2 is free. It will mount that task on this free thread and the task will continue instead of restarting. It will continue from the location on which it was blocked. So it was blocked on lock.lock .lock operation. Now it will perform the next operation which was update the shared resource. So using this concept of mounting and unmounting your tasks and saving their state and resuming from the location it had stopped, we can achieve more efficient utilization of our threads. And these tasks are known as coroutines or in our case, Java fiber. So in this way, we can have huge number of Java fibers, which are very lightweight and then it is the responsibility of Java Fiber Scheduler to use or to find a free thread and mount that particular fiber on that thread. And as soon as there is any blocking operation, it's the responsibility of the scheduler again to unmount that fiber and find another fiber to mount on that thread. So now we have created one more layer of abstraction to efficiently use the threads. The API is not finalized, but it can look something like this. So similar to how you use executor service, maybe you can call this static method of the fibers class and you submit your runnable there. And everything else remains the same. The advantages over threads, the most important is fibers or the coroutines are very lightweight, has few bytes or maximum of few kilobytes of memory as compared to one MB of a stack, which is allocated for a thread. The fibers, as we saw, using mounting and unmounting, they do not block the underlying thread. We can keep using the same API to write our code as opposed to using reactive programming and scheduling over the kernel threads or the native threads 
is handled by our Java Fiber Scheduler. So we need not worry about it. And because of all this, we can run millions of fibers in an application without overwhelming the JVM. And once this feature is enabled and incorporated into our frameworks or servers, it will enable our web servers to handle hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections at a time. The exact version in which this feature will be available is not known yet. But if you want to use this today, then the best option is to use Kotlin, a language which is completely compatible with Java and has this feature of coroutines. So you can keep using Java syntax as is, use this coroutine as a feature. And in other languages, we have the same concept of coroutines. In Python, we have this library called Trio. And in Go language, we have this concept of coroutines, which are sometimes also called as coroutines. So that's it for Java Fibers. Thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.